Hello everybody, and welcome to a very exciting video. So, today is a lot of things. Today is the 300th YouTube video. Today is also uh, the first of my 10th anniversary video and the Scott interview. So, I'm currently on here um, on the premiere, which starts in uh, about five minutes. So, um, for one, yes, this is the first of my Ted Denver crew video, unfortunately, for reasons. So, with the Try Not To Laugh video, I was able to get that filmed. Unfortunately, um, the video was like four hours long. Yeah. And I tried to export things and I couldn't because first there wasn't enough space on the computer and then it just wasn't working. So I said, fuck it. And I got rid of that video. So um after the T Jock demo, I actually really was excited to do that video. Unfortunately I could not get T Jock to open. In fact, um, I actually have TJOC right there. I could not get it to open. And I don't understand why. Here, I'll even try it right now. And I'll even show you. Wait for it. I swear, if this thing actually manages to open right now, I'm going to be really pissed. Because I tried so many times to open this on the day it came out, and it just wouldn't work. Also, it was really funny. So, earlier in the day, before it actually, like, came out, I looked on Steam for the Joy of Creation, because I was hoping it was going to be on Steam, and it was. Um... And I couldn't find the demo, which pissed me off. Oh, see, look at that. See? Doesn't work. I'll even try it again. Yeah, it's broken. I don't know why it's not letting me in. I tried, like... I actually made a thing about it. Um, I made a thing about it on Steam, like on the community discussions, which as far as I know, nobody responded to, although I could be wrong. I haven't checked it since like um, the other day. So, ooh, something from Daco. I hope you guys enjoy. Um, happy anniversary. Indeed. Um, so, as for the songs video, which is something I was going to do yesterday, I actually was going to record it yesterday. Unfortunately, we had to leave the doors open because of the damn vacuum robot coming in here. Um, so I couldn't record it yesterday. So that'll have to wait until after the actual anniversary. But that's okay, though, because we have this, and then tomorrow we have the collab... Tuesday is the Steel War announcement, Wednesday is Five Laps, and Thursday is the big Into the Pit. So, um, after Five Laps, I have seen the trailer for it, and it looks amazing. I have to say I'm really excited to play it. I'm excited to see what exactly it entails, even if it's just going to be a demo for now. Um, and for Into the Pit... I am going to make a little bit of a change of plans for the video. What I was going to do is I was going to sit here for five hours straight and see how much of it I got through. But with seeing how much struggle this thing has with a four hour thing, I think I'm going to actually dial it down to three hours. Um, so you know. But it can still have a bit of a meaning because 
Five hours is going to be for five nights of Freddy's. Three hours can be for three games. You know, like how FNAF 3 was going to be the original finale, and then FNAF 6 was the finale. Yeah. So the End of the Pit video will be a three hour video. Now, do I think I can get through End of the Pit in three hours? <laughs> no. There's no way in hell I can get through any game in three hours. So it'll just be a part one. I'm like literally every single other member of the community is going to beat it in like a 12 hour stream. You know. <laughs> um, but yeah. Also, as for the Scott interview, I never saw the original myself, but I do know of the whole thing where like he mentions the movies and um, how the community did not like FNAF 3 until he had to fix that with FNAF 4, and that he also stated that every game he made after FNAF 3 he thought would be his last. I do know of those, like, points, but I've never seen the actual thing. Um, because that was way before I joined the FNAF community. I didn't join the FNAF community until, um, I know it was before Security Breach, but not too long before that. Because um, I distinctly remember when Security Breach first came out and everybody was going crazy. I don't exactly remember, though, uh, when I joined. It was probably between AR and Security Breach. Probably. I think it was probably... Ooh. Stupid ads. So, oh, I'm going to pause from that for a minute. So, to keep talking about a couple things before we actually begin. So, I think I joined the community. I know it was before Security Breach. I think it was after I had started doing YouTube, though, but, like, shortly after. And I remember, like, back then, back then I knew of Five Nights at Freddy's, but I did not know of the sheer insanity that the franchise is. Um, back then I only, like, really cared about the first four games, and I didn't know any of the lore or anything. Um, and then shortly after I started doing YouTube, I, like, watched all of Game Theory. I think FNAF has actually probably introduced me to Game Theory. Um, And now I am crazy about the lore. I currently have a second version of FNAF Explained in the works. Oh, I've had it in the works for a long time. I was actually going to make it before the 10th anniversary. Unfortunately, there's not enough time for that. So I'll, I'll have to wait until, like, afterwards. And after Into the Pit comes out, who knows what kind of monkey wrenches we're going to have. So that'll probably come out like towards the end of the year, who knows. Anyway, time to watch this interview. Scott, tell me what's in the box. I think as the 10 year anniversary is upon us, I will give this as my, as my gift to the fan base on this 10th anniversary. What's in the box is... Oh my god, no way. Are we actually going to learn this? I still have a theory about this the other day. <laughs> Aww. Aww. Hey, Mabel. Yeah, she's the best. What's coming on, guys? Still come back again. Hope you're fantastic today. And it's the 10-year anniversary of Five Nights at Freddy's. It is August the 5th, which means if you've been looking at the list, what the official Twitter has been saying, it's the interview. Oh, I have. With Scott Crawford, everybody. Hey, everybody. How's it going? Doc, no, good to see you again. Me. Yes, six years since the last interview, right? Which is... Crazy. Wow. Uh, a lot of things have been happening That's since then. So let, let's go back a little bit. So the interview was August 2018. 
So after that, we got help wanted, special delivery, security breach, help wanted to ruin DLC. So there's a lot going on. And of course, the future games as well. Yesterday, uh, Steelwall has announced right. something. I don't know what it is yet because we're recording this, you know, a couple of months before. But guys, whatever it was, I hope you're very excited for it. Future Dorco into the pit as well. Stuff to look for. There's so much stuff to look forward to, and it's really cool that you've done like oh, um, a week. This was probably uh, before the schedule for the update. Ten year anniversary. You know, we've never seen something like this before. Ten years of Five Nights at Freddy's, which is yeah, it's pretty crazy, right? Man, I can't believe I can't believe it's been so long since our last interview. That really seems like just uh, it, it doesn't. How long did you say ago it was? Six years ago? Six that's years that's hard, hard to believe. I know. It's impossible to believe. I know, right? Um, I've actually got a song for you that I'm going to play for you to celebrate the 10 year anniversary. Okay, no, th this is getting things off to a kind of an awkward start, but I'll let you go on ahead. <laughs> okay. Are you no, ready wait, you're going to be performing? Wait, you're going to be performing this yourself or is something recorded? I've got the harmonica right here. Oh, oh a harmonica. I've okay, been, my favorite. I've been practicing this song for over 32 years. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, are you ready for this? I'm ready. <laughs> Come on now, you started this. Right, okay. Let's Ready? I'm, I'm really good. Come on, really Dr. Good. Now, I will admit that I, I couldn't actually hear that. I don't know if your I don't know if your thing was cutting the audio out. Well, I actually played a spell. Oh. The spell is from 1864 by a wizard named Dewey Muscruy. Okay. That spell has now hypnotized you to tell me all the lore of Five Nights at Freddy's. <laughs> Jeez, now, I thought we talked about this in advance. Now listen, <laughs> this, this is a bad idea to start talking about lore. All right, well here, you have to give me specific questions and I'll see what I can answer for you. <laughs> I but I make I make no promises. Scott, tell me what's in the box. Wow, just oh direct, God, just yeah. just out and direct, just like that. Yeah. <clears throat> well, look, I'm okay, totally it's the ten year anniversary, okay, and even though I like to be elusive, I like to kind of tease the fan base. I like to, and, and I do like there to be an air of mystery about things. Sometimes I do let things go on for too long. And I understand that sometimes things become not fun anymore and things can become frustrating for theorists. So, okay. I think as the 10-year anniversary is upon us, I will give this as my as my gift to the fan base on this 10th anniversary. What is it? What is it? What's in the box is... Come on. Come on. Standard. Damn it. Oh my god. And that's about it. And, th and that's it, man. <laughs> so like we've been speaking about, we'll 10 years of Five Nights at Freddy's, which is a crazy amount of time. Uh, I can't believe we're still here. Uh, it it's been such a journey. So I just wanted to ask you, uh, do you have a highlight moment for the whole 10 years of Five Nights at Freddy's since 2014? I, I, I think... I think there have definitely been a lot of a lot of satisfying moments. Like obviously, if if whenever one of the new games would come out and it would be positively received, that was obviously a huge relief. You know, there's never been any goal other than just giving everybody what they were really hyped up about. Because you know, when you when you see everybody getting hyped up and getting excited, sure and suddenly so something comes out that just is a, a big letdown. There's just no, there's no greater fear, I think, for a game developer. So. Um, that was always satisfying and a relief, but I think the I think the biggest highlight was probably just going to the movie theater to watch the movie when it finally came out because you know behind the scenes of all of the games throughout the years and behind the scenes of all the books being written and everything else, there was always the movie. The movie was just a slow burn project, even just starting as late as 2014. So that has been in the I background the being you know progressing. Yeah. For almost the entirety of uh, that, no, no, not almost the entirety. The entirety of that first nine years. Um, so to be able to 
to actually go sit in the theater and hear the reaction from everybody and hear the fans really enjoy it. That was definitely uh, that that was definitely a moment of of just re re real happiness for me. I think literally nine years, uh, you know, having ups and downs, you know. Uh, getting the script right as well. I know you've said on post before you've had so many scripts made for the movie. The the the, the plushies in Manhattan or something. That was one of the scripts. So yeah, it yeah. was. Uh, or the yeah, one I about can imagine how you know difficult it's been, like trying to get it all done. You know, I can just imagine. Well, I can't imagine it because I'm not you. But you know, when, it, when me, Raz, and Ryan and Baz uh, went to a premiere for it and sat down at the cinemas and we all looked at each other at the end and we had to like, we, we couldn't believe it. And we, we didn't even make the games. We've been there since, you know, basically day one. But we all said like, imagine how Scott's feeling right now, you know, just sitting down and seeing it actually, you know, on the big screen. It must be a crazy, crazy feeling. Yeah, and now that I've been through the process, you know, I can tell you it's a miracle that any movie gets made just being through that process, just how many wheels have to be turning at the same time um and how many things and even though this process took a long time for me you know hollywood works at just blazing speed where there's a hundred things happening at the same time and it's a miracle that these things get coordinated and sometimes things don't work out but sometimes they do on um, on the day that i was driving to new orleans and the shooting was supposed to start the next day on that drive i was on the phone it was, it was like a five hour drive from where i was i was on the phone the entire time trying to finish uh, contracts and finish negotiating points because there were still open items Ooh. with uh, there were still things that needed to be resolved with Universal Blumhouse uh, the Actors Guild the Writing Guild there were uh, uh, just Louisiana there were all of these things and any one of them not being uh, settled properly would mean we couldn't start filming and all of them all of those conversations were happening at the same time and all of them depended on one of the other ones and so that was a very stressful drive, but that's just the way that that's the way that Hollywood works. It's there's a million things happening at once. Um, it was it was definitely a whirlwind, but to see all of those pieces come into place, um, yeah, it, it was it was it was pretty remarkable. And and yeah, like you were saying, just all of the scripts, um, starting starting just with 2015. Um, you know, there were a couple of deals that weren't very good that I'm very fortunate. Uh, didn't pan out but then whenever i was with warner brothers briefly that that was a good deal and i was very very grateful to have that um but e but even that whenever the stars seemed to have aligned things just didn't work out there either and so i was really fortunate to meet up with jason blum and get to have a de that deal with blumhouse you know they had a lot of faith in the project and they were following my lead on a lot of things you know sometimes to a fault because lots of times i would throw things out and want to start over but uh you know they, they they were with me the whole journey they were with me and they believed in the vision and um everybody just had the fans at heart that's all anybody wanted to do we, everybody was just making sure that every part of the movie would be something that the fan base would look at and recognize or relate to or connect with and i think in the end we were able to accomplish that and um i'm just really happy with that and I think we landed with just the perfect cast, which again, that almost didn't happen either. There were a couple of instances where someone else was about to get a part and then something would happen that would make that not work out. And then someone better would step in. And I've, you know, and I've said this to, you know, uh, my contacts at Blumhouse numerous times just over this last six months, even since the movie came out thinking, aren't we glad that we got like Josh Hutcherson for this role? Like, isn't it great we had Elizabeth Lale for this role? Isn't it awesome we had Matthew Lillard for this role? You know, isn't it great we ended up with Piper yeah, Rubio for right. this role? Like, it, every single person that we ended up with was just absolutely perfect in those slots. And everybody was just a delight to work with. Um, once again, since I'm new to the, kind of the film industry, I got to talk to people about their other experiences on other projects. And it can be really scary because usually, from what I understand, every production has one <laughs> one member of the cast or one person on staff or just one person that you know causes problems or something like that we didn't have anything like that nothing like that everybody was just phenomenal um they were just a joy to work with and getting to go to filming was was really fun so it, it, was, it was a really fun experience and in the end i'm just happy that the fans were happy with it now that's not to say the film didn't have um 
it's places where it could have been improved and we're all you know and we all me and emma and jason blum we're definitely chat about that and looking to make sure the second movie is um a, a step up and an improvement so lots of good things to look forward to i think yeah, it's exciting. And yeah, you're right about the fan reaction. Uh, the fans absolutely loved it. Like, we all can't wait for the next movie. It's so exciting. And I'm so glad, like, um, it's actually happening as well. Um, so yeah, exciting times. So yeah, you said that you've got a highlight of the 10 years of FNAF. Um, if you could go back and change one thing in those 10 years, do you have anything that you would change? You can't say the box. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you know, the, the one thing I would change, I wish I could go back and have one more shot at FNAF World. I really, really do. Um, I, I, I know it still would probably definitely be the oddball in the series, no doubt. And maybe maybe it would still have been a, a poor decision in general. But there were just a lot of bad decisions made at the beginning of that project that doomed it from the start. Like I was making it with mobile in mind. So it was a really slow resolution. I was thinking about it as a game on the phones. Um, I tried to make the whole game on, on, on one frame and click team fusion. That just means I wasn't, I wasn't allowing it to be as big as it could have been. I was trying to cram it all together for my own convenience. Um, there, there were just, there were just several decisions that were made, um, that really hindered that. And also I was in a rush because I was getting, I was getting a little arrogant, thinking that, hey, anything I make is going to be gold, you know, and, and, and I was definitely, I definitely ate some humble pie with that really, really quick. And I learned that that is not the case. <laughs> and so I, I've tried to be very careful to not make that mistake again after that. But yeah, you know, if I could go back and change one thing, I, I wish I could maybe work with a different developer and just really make it a, a, a high resolution game, get in some really good graphics, maybe get someone else to you know help me with those graphics. And I, 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 it could have been a good game, could have been a good game. Who knows, M maybe somewhere down the line, if I get really antsy about it and have a lot of free time on my hands, may maybe FNAF 2 or FNAF World 2 might be a thing. Yeah, I was about to say that, it, it, you know, you, you could still get a, a different company to do a, a FNAF World game. It's not over yet. I think I've said this to you before. I love FNAF World. <laughs> I think it is so underrated. And I always say FNAF I World is underrated. I love it so much. It's just a charm to it. I, I really do. And I know you don't like it, but I absolutely love it, man. I, it, I really do. I, I love everything about it. If, if, I, if, I, if, if I'd spent, if I had allowed myself to work on it for one more year just like really double its development cycle and let it be a, a high res game i bet it would have been i bet it would have really been something but like i said who knows maybe for the sequel someday let's move on to mm. steel wall uh, the amazing steel wall Ooh. studios that was the next game after ultimate custom night help wanted one of my favorite games uh, in vr i absolutely loved it what has it been like the working trash. with steel wall uh, were you nervous about it because i know it, it's a, it's a big thing to you know, give a company your baby, basically, and let them, you know, do what you've been doing for the past five years. Um, how was it for the first time letting um, someone else work on FNAF? I was really nervous about it. I was really nervous. Um, you know, I, I went several years still doing it by myself, even after I had, even after I had the financial ability to pay other people. Again, I, I wasn't in that mentality of being able to do that. So even though I could have done that, I was still doing things just all by myself, all the way up through Pizzeria Simulator. Yeah. But by then, it was, by then it was, I knew that it was getting too much for me. I knew that I had to find another partner for it. And I was scared of that because, you know, there are stories all over the internet available about just games that went completely wrong because of games being mismanaged in the hands of, you know, development companies. And I'm sure that all of their pitches on the surface would have sounded the same, but I really got lucky. Uh, for that reason, I really feel like I got lucky because whereas I probably could have accidentally ended up with a company that did botch something, I didn't. I think I, I really honestly believe that I landed with the the best, just one of the best, one of the best development companies. Um, they've been just a, a pleasure to work with, and they've they've done a really great job. Um, you know, this this last one they did, Ruin. I thought it was just so much fun. So much fun, and, and I think that might be one of the. Uh, I think that might be my favorite thing that they've made was ruin and the things that they have planned, which I'm not going to talk about right here, but but the things that they have planned are really exciting too. So, yeah, yeah, I've been I've been really happy. It's been a really good experience. Well, I'll tell you, on help wanted. Well, I'm just going to throw in. I'm happy with help how help wanted come out. 
came out because at the time, and I don't have I don't have this anymore. I don't have a 3D. I don't have a VR setup anymore. But whenever the first Help Wanted came out, I did have a VR setup, so I was able to beta test. And of course, I was leading the charge to want to beta test my own games. Oh. I got into the Funtime Auditorium and fun time, and and I noped out of it. I I took the headset off, and I immediately got on the phone with Steel One and said, "I'm not doing it. I'm, I'm not going to test it." You test it. You're going to test it. You'll find someone else to test it. <laughs> I didn't even get jump scared by Foxy. I was just in there in the darkness, and I knew I wasn't going to do it. And I never played it again. And I never played Help Wanted. And I and I never played Help Wanted Two either. And I'm not going to. People need to understand I'll it play there, Ryan, because um, in the past, like when I've obviously done videos on Help Wanted One and Two, I get a comment saying like, um, "Oh, it, it's not that scary. You're overreacted. It's not that bad." Mm. But you don't know until you've literally put on the headset, right? Yeah. It, it's completely yeah. different, you know, just watching it from a screen is, compared to having the actual headset on. It's terrifying. Yeah, yeah completely different experience. It really is. Question, Glitch Trap is one of my favorite characters in, in FNAF now. I absolutely love Glitch Trap. Um, what are your thoughts on Glitch Trap as a whole uh, with, you know, with the de development of Help Wanted? I love the character. And, and I know that this is this is kind of one of the places where I, I know there's a little bit of a divide with maybe me and the fan base, or maybe just within the fan base, because I, I always lean sci-fi. I have a tendency to lean sci-fi, even though I like to, I try to come back into the roots of of the supernatural instead. But uh, I can't help my inclinations to lean sci-fi. So anything that involves possession of uh, AI or possession of uh, machines or circuitry, that I, I, I love that sort of thing. So I love the idea of glitch trap. I'm not a huge fan of the name. And here's the way that these here's the way that these things happen. Okay, and this happened with burn trap too. Whenever I'm in the div, whenever I'm in the planning phase with steel wool, we come up with temporary names for these characters. You know, whenever, so whenever we're doing the the pre production document, I'll say, oh well, he's glitchy. We'll call him glitch trap. Oh yeah, he's burned. We'll just call him burn trap. But then those names get embedded in the source code because because they use those temporary names also. <laughs> And once they're in the source code, and once someone finds them in the source code, that's it. Like that, that's the canon name now, and there's nothing I can do about it. Mm -hmm. And 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 hopefully, hopefully, we're learning our lessons going forward to 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 maybe find, <laughs> I, I don't know, to, to to just hone hone in on a, a better process there. Because yes, I love the character, not a huge fan of the name, but it is what it is for now. You know, it, it, it's it's the name. I love Glitch Trap's name. <laughs> it, it would, uh, could you think of a name like on the spot, like what you would want to call him or not? Oh, I, I have no idea. But you know what? A good example is a uh, Mexus, you know, from Ruin. Now th that was a character where, even in just my design of the game, I, I thought that through and I and I came up with that. Um, and I'm really happy with it. I, I really like that name. It's a really cool name. But now, see, if I didn't have one of those ready to fire off, I might have thought up something like, I don't know, Purple Trap or, or you know, or AI Trap or just something temporary. And then that would have been the can name. That would have been so much worse <laughs> than, than Nexus. So. After Help Wanted, uh, we got Security Breach. Uh, were you happy Nexus with the release of Security Breach when it first came out? Um, security breach. Uh, there, there's, there's a really big story behind that, and um, that that was definitely a challenging period, and a lot of things, a lot of things, just didn't align up uh, perfectly for that. And there were a lot of reasons for that. I mean, obviously, I, you know, I hear lots of studios and things kind of blame COVID for stuff, but there is a reason for that. You know, COVID took well structured work systems and suddenly scattered them. And expected the work to continue to flow, and it just doesn't work that way. I, from my understanding, I'm pretty sure most, if not every, member of Steel Wool got scattered across the country, and were trying to just carry on with the workflow. Um, and it, it's it's just it was just really difficult. I, I think that that's really the only example when um, my idea of how a game was going to go was misaligned with how things were going with Steel Wool, and. I had I had a specific story for this in mind, okay, for Security Breach. I really did. I had a very specific story in mind, and it is very different than the one that got in the game. And I think a part of that mm. is the way that I conveyed that to Steel Wool, because what I was trying to do was I was trying to tell Steel Wool to do specific things throughout the game 
put specific items in specific places, have specific characters do certain things. Meanwhile, not telling them what the story plot was because I, in my head, I was thinking, okay, when people find this, they will connect this to this to this and it will all be revealed. And I thought I could do that without telling Steel Wool the story plot. That didn't work out very well because they got all of these pieces and they thought it was their job to connect them in a way that made sense. And so really what you ended up having were the same pieces, but telling completely different stories. And and since I was trying to kind of tell a specific story with mine that went a certain direction, they were taking pieces I didn't fully understand and trying to craft a story out of them. And again, I don't blame them for that. I blame myself for that because I guess what I should have done is just said, hey, here's the story. Here's why these pieces are here. Here's how they're supposed to connect. And I'm gonna, I can give you a really easy example for this. And, and I'm, I'm hesitant to say this because I don't like messing with the lore, but I think in this case, it's okay. When it comes to burn trap, originally burn trap was never supposed to move. He was supposed to just be something you saw in the corners or like if you're walking past the machinery you might be able to peek in between two things and see him in the corner or propped up against a wall almost like almost like a, a some kind of decaying movie prop and you never fully understood what his purpose was and he had a very specific purpose and I'm not going to say what that purpose was but realistically he never moved well obviously that's not what we got in security mm -hmm. breach <laughs> in security breach we got a capsule opening and purple smoke flowing out and him climbing out and coming to get you <laughs> and so it's just not, not quite the same thing so but anyway it, it 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 didn't turn out the way anybody wanted but hey whenever that happens just like whenever uh you know i stepped in it a little bit with fnaf world you know me and steel will got together we were like look all that matters now is making things right by the fan base. That that's all that matters. You know, we we all had the best intentions going on. We all wanted to to make a good product, and we went in and we made uh, ruin for it. And and I and I, I hope that, that uh, redeemed the game. And I, I feel like it did because I think it was really great. And and yeah, and anything that we do going forward that continues uh, that story or has those same themes, um, I, I I think we're just going to be in a much much better situation to to continue on. So, uh, the Rune DLC came out uh, a year ago now, which is crazy to think about. Time's going so quickly, and the fan reaction to that was amazing. Everybody loved it, and everybody's looking forward to what's next. Um, the ending of Ruin, uh, with a specific character that came out, a new character into the games, the Mimic. Um, any thoughts on the Mimic? Uh, I, I, can, I cannot share any thoughts on the Mimic, other than I really, really like that character. This is a character that I'm that I really like and I'm really excited about. I think it's a really terrific uh, antagonist, and I don't think it's the last that we've seen of the mimic. That's all I'll say. Yes. Mm. With that, do you have a favorite okay. character in the Steel Wool era of games? I mean, the Music Man is too obvious, uh, too obvious of an answer, right? I mean, I, I no, that, uh, I, I think I think all of those all those characters turned out great. In fact, I think this is why it's hard to pick a favorite because all of them turned out so well, you know. Um, I've always really, really liked. I've always really liked Vanny as a character. I don't think that Vanny was utilized to her fullest potential, and so hopefully we'll Definitely see not. another opportunity for uh, for Vanny to return as well. We'll see. Ooh, okay. Moving on to the books. So the books have been amazing. Um, I've been doing little summary videos on the channel with Fazbear Frights. Uh, that that was awesome. Um, how has it been working on Fazbear Frights? It, it's actually really enjoyable. It's probably one of the most enjoyable things that I do because um, I just get to think up a really scary scenario and then I create a maybe a, a 10 to 15 page story out of it and then I have writers that I work with obviously and they take that and they really flesh it out and fill it out and add the details and turn it into a full length story and I get to kind of just really see it come to life. Um, yeah, so it, it's been really enjoyable and that's something that I really enjoy. Uh, it, it's, it's, and it's funny because it's one of those things where as long as I know that that's, that's something that's happening in my life, I might be at the gym or I might be watching a show and then suddenly something will come to mind and I'll be like, oh man, this is, this is going to make a great story. And I get right home and I start working on it. Do you have a favorite story out of all of them? <laughs> I think my favorite story, has, it, it, it's probably Bunny Call. I know oh. that that's kind of an oddball choice, but there's a reason for it because some of these stories are based on my real life experiences. 
Bunny call is not completely made up. Uh, I used to take my family to a family summer camp. Okay, this is one of my two. This is my two. My two oldest boys were maybe eleven and twelve at the time. Or, no, no, no. I bet they were thirteen or fourteen. It's hard to remember exactly when this was. But my. But then I had younger two that were just babies still. And whenever we showed up at camp, and we were all in the auditorium signing up for activities, you know, it was rafting and boating. One of the things you could sign up for was a panda call, okay? And a panda call was, it's a very deceiving title because what that meant is that early in the morning, a bunch of the camp counselors dressed as killer clowns <laughs> would come into your cabin and scare the crap out of your kids to wake them up early and drag them off to their daily activities. And so I signed up my two my two oldest, you know, my, uh, Ian and Braden, you know, my old beta testers from whenever they, you know, for all their lives testing my games. I, I signed them up for it. And I thought, oh, yeah, this will be kind of fun. It was kind of fun until the next morning started rolling around. I started thinking about what I'd done, you know, because then the next morning I woke up at five in the morning and I realized they're out there somewhere like the, this. This is happening right now. And I started listening for screams and I started listening for noises. And I even snuck out and went outside. And it was dark, and there were crickets chirping. And I was looking around, and I and I just thought to myself, somewhere out here in the dark, in these trees, are a bunch of clowns, and they're coming to my cabin. <laughs> and and it was it was it was a really really scary sensation. And so I just went back inside, and I, and I looked at my family sleeping. I looked at my baby sleeping, and my my kids, and my wife. And I was like, what have I done? Like, what have I done? <laughs> Of course, it ended up not. Of course, it ended up not being a big deal because then I just heard a soft knock at the door and I opened it and there was a row of killer clowns. I said, and I just said, and I, and I just said, I said, never mind, you guys, and they just walked on. And so, so what? So it wasn't a big deal, but it was still a really eerie feeling, feeling like I had signed up for something that I'd regretted and I couldn't undo it, you know. And so I based a bunny call on that. Oh, that's awesome! You said that you've got relatable stories. Um, do you have a relatable story with Fazgu? <laughs> <laughs> look uh, okay it, it, listen anytime there's a series of a whole bunch of different things you're gonna have some that are great and then some there's like well like what, what was going on with this you know i i don't know how to explain the faz but i'm sure i had something in mind that 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 was really great but you know they can't all be winners <laughs> now now i will say now i will say a couple of the other ones that had real life connections you know, sometimes you hear about people talking about their sleep paralysis demons or whatever. I, I, that's never really made sense to me, but now it kind of it kind of makes sense to me, and I don't know why it does. Yeah, every once in a while, a person will you'll you'll wake up, but you'll still be paralyzed in your sleep, and for some reason, I guess in that moment, you're still half dreaming, and so you have a tendency to still maybe see something before you fully wake up. And the blackbird creature was mine. That 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 creature on the cover of Blackbird. Is, is my sleep paralysis demon because what? I was I was on vacation I was by myself and and I don't know what the circumstances were I feel like I was taking a midday nap but I woke up with a jolt and for a split second I saw that thing standing over me and I couldn't move and my body was tingling and I was just frozen up and I, I was just so disoriented after that but I never forgot that and I knew immediately after that's like I've got to get this into a story somewhere like this this crazy looking creature that is crazy <laughs> that is absolutely crazy i i've never had sleep paralysis so i don't know what my creature would look like but i hope it doesn't look like that <laughs> I, I don't think it's a normal I experience i don't think it's an experience you should want to have i don't i, yeah. I don't feel like it's a healthy thing so yeah. if you, if that hasn't happened to you i think you're in a good place do you have a least favorite story uh, i don't know I, I think it i think it probably might be the faz goo or no, I mean, come on! It's it's got to be the one where uh, the guy gets pregnant with Springtrap's baby. I'm not sure what I was thinking about. You know, uh, again, that's one of those things where, oh man, this is gonna be really creepy. But then you you step back and look at it from afar, and you're like, ah, uh, I don't know if this is a good idea. And I swear, I wasn't picking on Matt Pat. That wasn't that wasn't a story designed with Matt Pat in mind. It really, really wasn't. You know, listen. Whenever you're doing these stories for this long, eventually you just run out of names, and you're yeah. going to cover all the names. You know, yeah. but eventually I'll get around to Daco. You know, and so <laughs> if you see Daco in one of these stories, it's not something personal. It's just because I ran out of names. You know, I don't know. Daco is a very specific name that you'd have to get to. <laughs> I, I probably have a few more to go through before I get to that, so you don't have anything to worry about. When do my summary videos? Um, and I know, I know a lot of people say the same. People who loved Goosebumps when they were kids uh, find these really relatable, right? Um, 
And I know kids at school now read Fazbear Frights like their, their Goosebumps books. And as a kid, my favourite TV show was Goosebumps. Would you ever think about oh, uh, or like the idea of Fazbear Frights ever being like a TV show like Goosebumps where it's like a series of some of the best stories or something adapted? Ooh. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, and that's something that can definitely happen. Um, Especially oh, now that the first movie came out and was successful, I think that really opens the door to lots of other potential opportunities. The only thing to be mindful of is I don't want to oversaturate the market and just create too much. And I think that um, sometimes sometimes we get a little bit of that where franchises have movies and too many TV shows and it just kind of waters everything down. But uh, but I really do like that idea. And it, it is definitely something that could happen, for sure. Awesome. So the next segment is the FNAF movie. I've got some questions for you, Scott. Uh, first off, I absolutely loved the movie, as you know. And I know a lot of people did as well. The fans absolutely loved it. And it did really well at the box office as well. Super successful. Congratulations to you. Wow. Blumhouse, Universal. So, yeah. Um, first question is... How was working on the first FNAF movie after waiting for so long, after announcing it back in 2015? Well, you emailed me back in 2015 uh, about it. I still remember that email. But yeah, how, how was it? it? It took a really long time to get off the ground, really just because of the screenplay. But after, after the screenplay was really locked in, from there, all the wheels started turning, you know, all the engines fired and it took off. And, and it was a really fun experience from there. And, and really the screenplay, it, the screenplay just had a lot of challenges um, because of what it was. And it's really, you know, throughout all of those years, I worked with a lot of different directors, a lot of different writers, a lot of really talented people that eventually would end up leaving the project, but still really talented people. And it was really just a matter of, um, there's just material that's difficult to translate to the screen. And one of the one of the biggest issues is is the animatronics, obviously being the monsters in the monster movie. If I were to approach any writer of a horror movie or any director and say, "Okay, here are your monsters, um, go make a monster movie with them," that's easy. You know, you give them all a knife, you go in, you just make your generic slasher, but just have it be, you know, Freddy, Bonnie, Cheek, and Foxy doing the slashing. Uh, the 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 nuance here is that these animatronics are possessed by the spirits of kids. And these are innocent kids. These are victims themselves. So it's and it's very very difficult to still have a horror movie, still have those kills that you need, but still preserve um, preserve the innocence of those kids. And it's a, it's a really difficult thing to do. And there were several screenplays that did not hit that mark. And I, and I was I think I was more cautious about that and more picky about that than anything else. Um, if the if, if if kind of the innocence of those spirits was not preserved properly, I wasn't going to go wasn't going to go forward with it. And so, you know, one quick example is the way that we were able to have a couple of kills in the movie was obviously the vandals. You know, you have a group of people who are breaking in, they're disrespecting the place, they're trashing the place, they're there with bad intentions, and then you combine that with the fact that these animatronics are, you know, the spirits in them are these kids that are basically very confused and lost animals backed into a corner and kind of left with this impression that adults are out to get them. And then you have these violent adults breaking in. And so it, it, it allows you to have those, that kill count while still being like, well, I can kind of see how that might happen. Um, it, 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 it was a, it was a tricky thing to do, but I think we were able to accomplish that. M manipulated by William Afton still as well. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's right. That's absolutely right. The, the, the drawing on the wall was also kind of this, this layer, this blanket of manipulation over them all. So all of those things combined, um, you could see how these actions the uh, could happen while it not necessarily being the fault of the kids. With the fort scene as well. I loved the fort scene. I know some people were a bit confused by that, like, <laughs> why, why are they building a fort? It's a little random. I got it straight away. <laughs> you know, you, you just want to show the audience that they're just kids, right? You know, uh, were you happy with the first movie and how it came out? Yes, I, I am. I am very happy. I mean, look, anytime anybody, I, I think pretty much anybody who's been through a process like this would be able to look back. And I do this with my games, too. You look back and be like, well, I, I wish I'd tweak this. Or maybe this could have been like this. Or maybe this could have been like that. But you have to just really take a step back and look at it as a whole and and where it came from 
all the things that could have gone wrong and all the things that went right and just be really grateful that so many things just fell into place you know and i can give you a really quick example of why uh, why i don't want to second guess too much you know at the at the 11th hour of this movie coming together um we still really didn't have a a a music composer and i really wanted an animated mm. intro i was really pushing to have that 8 bit animated intro but we didn't have anybody and really not really anybody to have a, have an idea of what kind of music we were looking for 11th hour newton brothers come in and they write off that banger of a track like absolute insane oh, yeah. like I, i you know i listened to that the first time and i was like wait a minute do i have a theme song this fine rest of phrase have a theme song you know and i i even uh, i i called i called you know emma tammy on the phone i was like wait do we have a theme song now like i can't tell you how excited i was over that and you better believe you're going to hear that again at the beginning of the the second movie too i mean like I, that, that was just so Yay. incredible and his brother just knocked that out of the park um It so yeah uh, so many things went right that i i don't think i don't think i'm going to dwell too much on you know what i would go back and try to do differently as we know the movie was a major hit in 2023 super successful the biggest horror movie of 2023 as well uh how does that feel seeing that happen um, it, it's 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 nice that part is nice it's more important to me that if the critics had loved it and but the fan base was grumbling and saying wait this isn't how it is in the lore wait this i did we didn't like this i don't like how they did this this and this and the fan base was unhappy that would be a failure to me i'm i'm perfectly happy with all the critics hating it and the fan base reacting positively to it so yes it, it is nice that the movie was successful however that is not the correct metric by which to judge the success of this movie um and and in, in fact um opening night which was thursday night you know where i am I went to the very first showing and the theater was pretty much empty. There were only a couple other other people in there, but it was a one o'clock showing, so but still I, I saw that as kind of a bad sign, but I just watched it anyway. Then I went to the I went to the next showing, which was just later in the evening, and I told myself I wasn't going to go online. I wasn't going to read any reviews. I t- I had already told everybody at Blumhouse and I told my legal team, "Don't talk to me. Don't call me." Don't email me, don't send me charts, don't send me facts or figures. I don't want to hear anything about anything. I'm going through this whole weekend blind. I just want to experience what everybody else is experiencing. Well, before I went into that second showing, I was just by myself. And and then later that evening my whole family was coming into town by the way. My whole family was going to come in town and watch the movie with me that night. But this showing I was still sitting by myself. I was checking my email and I accidentally saw one of the reviews. And I saw that it was terrible. And that opened the floodgates and I went and started reading all of the other reviews. and i immediately texted my family saying don't come don't don't come you know th- th- this is over i want to be by myself and i was already thinking in my head like how am i going to write a letter to blumhouse apologizing for this how am i going to write a letter to the fans apologizing to this for just wasting everybody's time and i was just incredibly depressed but somehow somehow jason blum caught wind of of this i don't know who i asked a question to or what i said but you know he he started just bombarding me with text messages saying saying Scott the fans love it the fans love it you know the movie's a big hit everything's great he was just you know in all caps everything all caps my phone was just blowing with all caps texts and so he he really talked me through that to try to encourage me that that even though the critics hated it you know there was a lot that the, there was a lot to be loved there by the fans and so then i i had my family come to town anyway and we just sat in a in a packed theater and listen to you know the cheers and enthusiasm and it really lifted my spirits but you know for a couple of hours there man i was i was pretty distraught i thought the whole thing was just a complete disaster but it was a but, but it wasn't it, it all it all worked out okay you know it all worked out okay yeah. and, and and again again i the movie's not perfect there's definitely room to improve uh but but yeah i'm, I'm definitely happy that it was in in general uh, received well by the fan base the second movie um which is you know it's been announced that it's going to be coming out in 2025 is it December 2025 yeah December 5th 2025 i think is there anything exciting to talk about on the second movie anything you want to say i'm not going to give away too many details um but I, but i i i will say that i'm following kind of the same formula where the first movie is focused on the first game So I'm going to try to carry on that tradition onward with future movies, and I think that that is absolutely the way to go. And I think everyone's going to be 
really, really excited for what's planned for the second one. You know, the first one was really challenging because it's so much setup. It's like, how do you establish all of this? But now that we have that launch pad, where to go from there came a lot just more natural. It, it, it felt a lot more natural. And we were able to really craft just a, a really great story, I think. And I'm, I'm, so I'm really excited about it. And I won't say anything more, but I, I'm, I'm really hopeful that everyone's going to really love uh, what's, what's going what's gonna to come around December 2025. Yeah, so exciting. And is, is Emma back and everything? Oh, yes. Yeah, well? Emma, yeah, Emma's going to be back. She did such a great job on that first one, you know. Yeah, that's, that's really good, having the same director. So now we're going to be talking about Into the Pit, uh, the new game that's coming out yeah. on Mega Cat Studios. Uh, we just got the trailer, another trailer, a couple uh, like last week, um, and it looks amazing. It looks so good. Um, how has it been working on the game based on a Fazbear Fright story? It's definitely been a unique experience. You know, I first started talking to Meg. I mean, it's been years and years since this, that game has been in development, and originally. It was just supposed to be a little novelty one-off. It's like, oh yeah, here's this little company that makes 16-bit cartridges, and that was that was immediately appealing to me because I'm all about the Super Nintendo. And so if I so if I was so if I could make something that would come on a on the Super Nintendo cartridge, you know, sign me up. That was that was the most exciting thing, I'd, the most exciting product I'd ever, I'd ever worked on. It was still just supposed to be a novelty, but as the development went on, everybody was looking at it, thinking this this looks this looks pretty good. This actually looks really good. Um, and so they just kept on going with it. Uh, they could have stopped a lot sooner and they could have they could have stopped with just a little simple novelty game, but they just kept going and I kept looking at thinking, yeah, keep going. And they kept going and I would keep looking at it and it just turned into this big, full-fledged, full-sized game. Um, so we obviously decided to venture away from strictly the cartridges um, so that everybody can be able to play it on steam and everything but it's really unique it's just a really really unique game and i do love that it really gets into just this really gritty kind of these kind of gritty graphics that i haven't seen since well i guess since the late 90s whenever you had those point and click type adventures and you had that real kind of a, a that pixelated art style that that can be really creepy at times i don't know it's going to be a really unique experience and i think that everybody's going to really be excited about it i really i really do awesome i can't wait to play it um, how has it been working with Mega Cat Studios then? Oh, it's 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 been great. It's been really great. Um, I really haven't had to give them. I mean, I mean, I have, I have had to give them direction, but for the most part, it's been weird. They'll, they'll go, they'll go into, they would go into the hole for six, seven, eight months at a time, and I wouldn't hear anything from them to the point where I thought, is, is this okay? And I would even, you know, I tell my, I talk to the other people that I work with, it's like, is this game okay? Is this going to be okay? Are they okay? Do I need to check on this? Do we need to check on them over there. But then I would get an update, and it would just be all this crazy new stuff and all this crazy detail, this fluid animation. It's just crazy, crazy, crazy stuff. Um, and then they'd go back into the hole again for five, six, seven months, and, and then we just repeat that cycle. But but yeah, but now here we are finally at the end of that road, and I think it's just turned out really great. Like I said, really unique, and I think everybody's going to really like it. The, the reaction to the trailer has been amazing. All positive feedback about it, super excited. Um, people love it. The, the story of Into the Pit as well. Um, Into the Pit's probably my favorite Fazbear Fright story. Um, so with all the positive feedback about it, um, what do you see for the future of FNAF spin-offs uh, made by other studios in the future? Oh, it's definitely a possibility. In fact, um, I'd really like them to start working on Fetch. I think Fetch would make a really good game after this. You know, some stories obviously cater more toward being a good game than others, but uh, there's something really scary about the thought of something always being out there and kind of watching your house and then and then trying to come in and do things for you like this is kind of a scary thought the thought that the thought that i might be online shopping looking for a specific thing and somehow something out there is hearing that and receiving that and then gonna come to me sneak inside and, and put it somewhere without me knowing that it was there this is this is a creepy scenario it's a creepy setup and i think it'd be a and i think it'd be a really cool game to have to stop this thing because obviously fetch was out doing a lot of menacing things and that to sneak in. around a neighborhood and stop this thing that's sneaking around so undetected. I don't know. I think it'd be a really cool game. So hopefully that'll be the next project. We'll see. As the franchise has grown bigger, 
What challenges have you faced with running a franchise of this size? Is there anything you could think you could be doing better? I, I, I think something I should have maybe been doing better is I should have had a better, a better structure in place as far as people to talk to the fan base. You know, I've, I've always kept that on myself all during the years, and and in the early years, I think that worked great because it was a a little indie game, a little indie community, and then me, the indie dev, just chatting with the community and talking, but. As the years go by and the f franchise gets bigger and bigger, I don't know. I, I feel like I've slowly, slowly kind of lost touch with the fan base. Unfortunately, it's, it's not that same. It's not that same relationship that it used to be. I, I really used to enjoy chatting with everybody and just kind of uh, I don't know. And, and, and I guess that's I guess that's expected because FNAF is is more of a. It is more of a big. It's kind of a just just kind of a bigger thing down it, and it's bigger than one person and I can't just pretend like I can hop online and chat with everybody and solve everybody's problems anymore. Used to, I kind of could. I could just go in there and chat with everybody and resolve little problems as if it was like just a squabble on a forum. I can always just step in and solve it, but and it's yeah. just not the same. And I think that I should have realized that sooner. And I'm really only realizing that this year that I really need to have a better structure in place. You know, and the fan base deserves that. The franchise deserves that. The fan base deserves that to have um, more people in charge and running a, a Twitter page and official news feeds, you know, an official news feed so that there's not so much confusion about what's real and what's not real and real news and fake news. And is this confirmed? Is this not confirmed? You know, I could have avoided years of that if I just kind of uh, had a better structure in place with um, people to listen to. And like I said, a news feed and someone else to just provide better answers to the fan base. So I, I'm trying to get all that in place. And I, th I really think it. I, th I think it would just better serve the fan base. And I think everybody would be a little happier if it's not just me trying to jump in and <laughs> straighten things out when needed. Yeah, I, I think I think the Twitter's a great idea. Um, yeah. We're recording this in June, but you know it, it was announced today. The schedule for what's coming out during that week is really exciting and and really good. Uh, so people. You know, can get you know get excited for the anniversary. They kind of know what's coming, which is really exciting. And you know, commu communication like that. Um, you know, it, it, it's it, you know people have really appreciated that. So thank you for doing that. Um, and looking forward to seeing what happens next on the Twitter, what they announce. And apart from the second movie to look forward to, is there anything else you could hint at? Uh, for the future, Ooh. any future titles or any little hints uh, to get people excited for the future? One, one of one of the one of the good things is going to be coming from Steel Wool, but that's going to be announced here in this same week that your interview is going to air. So, I think that that's it, it, in fact I'm not sure if it was right before this or right after this. Yeah, it might have been right after this. Yesterday, yesterday. Yesterday, okay, okay, um, and obviously everybody knows about Not the movie. Now. And right now, the the books are these uh, interactive books, which I read things like that growing up, and so I'm I'm excited about those. And I've tried to add some depth into those to where you can actually collect items in them and things like that. So it's really not just about picking a path; it's about picking a path and getting something, and then going to the other path and being able to use something. So it it makes it. It makes it more interesting and more intricate. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's the plan for movies, games, and books. And I already told you my, my hope for the next uh, Mega Cat game. And <clears throat> and there is another game planned with Steel Wool, but that's not going to be announced for a while yet. So I, I'm, I can't talk about that. But there is something down the pipe. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> even even beyond, even beyond even beyond what's being announced this week, there's something beyond. But I'm not. But I can't talk about that. Yeah. So I won't spoil anything. Um, but I read the week before, guys, and it is it is good. So please, you know, um, check it out when it comes out. Um, I'm looking forward to the Into the Pit one. Um, VIP is is the interactive novel VIP another one as well. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. VIP is it's one that I did with Scholastic, just like the others, but it's just going to be free. It's specifically for this event. I mean, I might still be included in a box set later down the road, but no, for this week, it was made specifically for this event um, <clears throat> by the same by the same author, I believe, as the week before. So if you enjoyed that one, you will you'll enjoy VIP. And I I'm, I really love the story for 
for VIP. I'm not going to ruin it, but it, it's it's it might be one of my favorites. So hopefully everybody really enjoys that. That's awesome. I'm pretty sure it comes out before the interview. So okay, yeah, great. Future me, if you're watching, probably <laughs> loved it. There is a collab announcement tomorrow from this interview. Whatever it is, I don't know, but um, it seems that you've been more true. open with collaborations with games recently, the, 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 the Funko one as well. Are you more open to more collabs since we last spoke during the last interview? Uh, like, would you be interested in whatever it is? I don't know. Like. Fortnite or Dead by Daylight, have those popped into your head at all? Or I'm very careful with collaborations because I want to protect the brands and I want to make sure that Five Nights at Freddy's stays as Five Nights at Freddy's. And there are some games where even if I really enjoy the game, it just doesn't feel like a it doesn't feel like a good match. It feels like a, it feels like a mismatch. The brand integrity is the most important thing for me in keeping everything feeling like it belongs and so that's really been my only that's really been my only only hesitancy I feel, I feel like i am branching out a little bit and i am a little bit more open to those things than maybe i was in the early years but i'm still very careful about it we'll just see we'll we'll see how things go okay um anything else you would like to add to finish off the interview let's see here um <laughs> no i mean I, I i think i think things are in a good place and like i said i think that the things that are I think the things that are on the horizon are all things to to be excited about, and I think that everybody's going to really enjoy um, the things that the fan base is really going to enjoy. <laughs> and, and I wish I could. I wish I could talk about those more, but I don't, I don't feel like I can. So, do you think we're going to have another interview in ten years' time? <laughs> it, it doesn't have to be ten years. We, we we can try to do this a little bit more often. But what, uh, every five years? <laughs> yeah, every five years. There we go. Okay. Shaking your hand. Just make it a regular thing. <laughs> okay, awesome. The biggest thing that everybody has been begging me for this interview when I announced it is the box. That is, everybody just wants to know anything about it because it is, it's the biggest mystery out of the whole 10 years of FNAF, I would say. Uh, maybe Midnight yeah. Motors, Motors is number two, uh, but yeah, I'd say the maybe. box is the biggest the biggest mystery that everybody wants, like even a tiny snippet of something. Uh, help. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, I, I can I can try to give somewhat of an answer to that, even though it might not be extremely satisfying for a lot of people. So I would I would encourage people to to turn off the interview if if they don't want if they don't want an answer that they might not be happy with, but. You know, whenever I make I all these know. games, there know. are a lot of things that are in my head that are just flowing ideas. And when I have them and put them there, it's the first half of something. It's like a, it's like a string or a rope just like reaching out. And I know that what's there on the other end is there. I, I trust that it's there. I know that it's there. And then whenever I progress forward, the rest of that just reappears. The rest of it appears and is in just fits into place perfectly that's how all my games have been made I, I i feel that there is something there and i make the roads to get there for that to be revealed but then sometimes when things do progress the roads aren't always the same roads as the ones that had been planned before and so what that means is even though at the time something was definitely there something was definitely reaching out to be there and i could feel that it was there the progression of the story didn't go there and so i those strings never got pulled on and those uh in the other half of that idea remained in remained in the remained in the ether remained in my subconscious all of that to say there is something in the box but i never pursued it and i don't know if i can find it again and i think that that's the best answer that i can possibly give for that scott thank you so much for the interview uh, myself and everybody really does appreciate it. Uh, we're looking forward to the future. We're looking forward to this week. Uh, future me uh, is probably uh, stressing out, uh, playing all the demos and getting ready for Into the Pit in a few Ooh. days. I'm so excited for Into the Pit. 
Uh, I, I really, really am. And all the, the fanverse stuff as well. Uh, my pop goes and the joy of creation, that demo. I'm looking forward to playing all of those as, as well and reading the new book. Uh, there's a lot in that week. I'm going to just be MIA that whole week. I've already told my friends and family, like, I'm not, I'm not going to be here for the whole week. <laughs> don't, don't call me. Don't text me. I'm going to be in this room just doing everything I can that week. And yeah, uh, we really do appreciate it. So yeah, I think that's it. Which is really cool. weird. That, that hour went so quick. Thank you guys for watching. Again, I appreciate you guys. Uh, thank you. Without you guys watching the channel, um, you know, I wouldn't be doing this in the first place, um, interviewing Scott. Uh, so it really does mean a lot to me. Thank you so much. And yeah, uh, I hope you all have a fantastic 10-year uh, anniversary week and you're all enjoying yourselves playing the demos and reading the books and stuff and are excited for Into the Pit. Uh, and Steel Wars announcement as well. That's so exciting. Uh, but yeah, uh, thank you, Scott. I appreciate it. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll both leave now. <laughs> All right, sounds <laughs> good. Thanks for it. having me, Doc. We'll talk to you later. <laughs> thank you, Scott. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye. All right. Now that was something right there. Wow. Yeah, that is something. Oh, that wasn't even a full hour? Really? Was that not? Oh, wow, that wasn't even a full hour. That's crazy. Now that was cool. People are all just, like, hyped in the chat. That was enjoyable for sure. That was definitely enjoyable. Um, so, some interesting things. So, Into the Pit, he called it a spin-off. So, it might be canon, it might not be. I'm not sure. Honestly, I hope it's canon. Um, you know, that'd be cool. Um, a fetch game in the near future, perhaps? That'd be cool, that'd be fun. I would love it if fetch got a game. Um, you know, so maybe, maybe they could also do games on, like, the other short stories that are present within the book, like, To Be Beautiful, Count the Waves, Lonely Freddy, Out of Stock. I don't know. Or maybe just do, like, the cover story. Yeah. Maybe there could be Tales game. You know, like a Dinophobia game. A Mimic game. Oh, that probably wouldn't work, though. That might not work. Especially if the Tales books are canon games, which I do not personally believe that. But, you know, it's just a theory. Um, I'm very excited for the second movie. Unfortunately, I did not go to the theater when it first came out. I did watch it on the day it came out, I believe. But, I did not go to the theater. Uh, we saw it here at home on Peacock. I really wish we would have gone to the theater. Um, oh well. There's always the second one, you know, maybe we'll do it then. Um, there's, sorry, something weird on Twitter just popped up. I don't know what the hell that was. So, of course, like, I've been looking at all of the posts that the Scott Games Twitter account has been making, you know, stuff about my pop goes, also like the pictures as well. Um, you know, we got, like, that there. I don't know if it's focusing. When I did this for the schedule in the last video, it didn't focus, which was kind of irritating. But, yeah, kind of interesting. Not exactly sure what that's supposed to be for, but cool. Um, thing with the Joy of Creation. 
I don't know why the demo won't open for me. Maybe it, maybe it won't. I don't know. Um, I will hopefully play the full game when it comes out sometime in 2025. Um, here we go. Here we have Green Eyes, which two characters really um, come to mind. I think that these eyes either belong to Toy Bonnie or possibly Baby. I have seen, like, something recently um, that was like, maybe Spitzer location will be in the sequel. Um, I think it was like a article that popped up on my phone like the other day. It was like, the Ella slash Baby cameo appearance in the first movie is teasing Spitzer location for the sequel. Which, who knows, maybe that's true. But, you know. They could be baby eyes, or they could be Toy Bonnie's. More likely Toy Bonnie. Um, now, does that mean that Stitch Location won't be a part of the sequel? No, that, that, that's a possibility. Anything is possible with sequels. Um, it's definitely going to be interesting to see what they do, especially for the third one, um, with what they've done with the first one, because, you know, the spring locking had already happened. Um... So it'll be interesting to see what they do going forward with the movie. Um, here's my whole thing about VIP. Another movie picture. Um, not exactly sure what this is supposed to be. I think maybe, like, I would say probably Chica. Maybe Toy Chica. I kind of what I'm thinking. Either Chica or... Uh, Freddy. Probably Twitchy Chica, though. And then, of course, the image for the interview that we just watched. Yeah, that was, that was fun. Um, so, I am very excited for Into the Pit. Um, a possible fetch game in the future. I think it would be interesting if they did, like, a Fast Fair Fright animated series, like a spinoff series. That would be kind of interesting, maybe. Um, I did not know that some of the Fright stories are actually based off of his real-life experiences. I did not know that. Um, Blackbird? I could definitely see Blackbird as a paralysis demon. I totally see that land. Look at that cover. Um... <laughs> Like Satan in disguise. Um, yeah, I believe the collab is tomorrow, I think, right? Yeah, the collab is tomorrow. The Steel Wool announcement is on Tuesday. So Now, what's interesting is that he said that besides whatever they're announcing on Tuesday, that there's also something big coming up as well, which is interesting. So to me, that kind of makes me think that he's half confirming, but also not really, that the announcement is DLC and not a full-fledged game. But who knows, maybe we'll get, like, it is possible that maybe the announcement could be, like, Fall Fest or something, and then we get an announcement for, like, yet another separate game in the near future. Who knows? Um, I still think it's probably DLC, though. That probably makes the most sense. Maybe. Who knows? Uh, the next game that they make in general will probably be Fall Fest. It's either going to be Fall Fest or... Um, a continuation of Ruin. I mean, well, what else are going to do besides that? Um, besides DLC. Um, yeah. And also, him kind of like answering what's in the box. I think it was a bit of like a long answer, but from what I gathered, I think what he was trying to say is that 
he was that he knew what was in the box, but that over time he'd forgotten what exactly he wanted to be in the box, and that he's not sure if he can figure out what he wants to be in the box now, and so that loose thread might remain loose for, you know, another decade, who knows. So, now, my personal theory, uh, you know, I think it's the body of Cry Child. That's my personal headcanon. Um, it's funny, though, that I saw, like, a theory video about it the other day, and I think it was I think it was by Twisted Animatronic, I'm not sure. I think, right? It was someone who did like a video on who did the Bio A seven and what's in the box as well as um who is old man consequences. Um with who is old man consequences they said Henry. I think that's a logical answer. With the Bio A seven I think they said Mangle. And I'm leaning a little more towards that as well. With what they said was in the box, I believe they said it was the mask of Golden Freddy. I'm a little iffy about that, but I think that was just an amateur, or maybe it was someone else. I don't know. Half the theories I watch are from people that I know, and the other half are just from, like, random, like, theories that pop up on my feed. Um... But still good ones. Um, some of those random theories actually, like, kind of formed my headcanon a little bit. Um, which you'll see when the updated version of FNAF Explained comes out. Um, probably, like, at the end of the year, maybe. I don't know. I'm, def I'm not going to continue writing it until Into the Pit comes out. And we get, like, the majority of the lore for it. That is, you know, if it's going to be canon. If it's not canon, then obviously it doesn't matter. But if it is canon, you know, who knows? Because um, honestly, with the writing FNAF explained, the hard part is not really trying to figure out what the modern timeline is. I mean, because here's kind of what makes it hard to write the timeline. But for one, these little details like, you know, um, like, is Gregory a robot? Is Michael still alive? Does Freddy have a possessed soul? You know, um, two Vanessas, you know, like, those, like, little details. It's kind of hard to determine, like, a solid answer on that. But it's also more so with, like, the early timeline, like, the origins with Fall Fest, um, as well as MCI. MCI has kind of been a hard part to figure out lately for me. Because when I did the original FNAF Explained, I didn't, I don't think I touched on MCI at all, which was kind of stupid. I don't think I touched on MCI at all in the original um, I think all I did with the original that I explained is I just, like, did a brief summary of each game, um, in, like, the order chronologically the timeline would go. I don't think I really, like, explained the story. So it wasn't really an explanation of FNAF. Um, but yeah. So, the two hardest parts of writing FNAF explained are the earliest parts as well as MCI. With MCI, the reason why it's been hard is because of Help 1 and 2, um, because of the gravestones, and like timeline placement of by the 3, Charlie, Elizabeth, you know, all of that. Um, so hopefully that FNAF Explained video comes out by the end of the year. Um, hopefully. I mean, it should, because we'll probably have all the lore, like, like, if Into the Pit is canon, we'll probably have all the lore for it by the end of August. So, at that point, it'll just be a matter of will and prioritizing what to do, because 
besides FNAF, I have a lot of other stuff to worry about, like the project and, you know, just other videos in general. So, yeah. But that was a good um, interview. That was definitely enjoyable. I was very worried I wasn't going to make it to this premiere because um, brunch. Um, I cut it really close. By the time I got finished eating and I came up here, I had like 10 minutes to get to this video page to set this up, um, to get everything started. You know, thank God I have things figured out with how I'm recording videos. Otherwise, I would have not made it to the premiere, which it would have really sucked if I had to wait until this thing finished airing and then watch it as a video. You know, that would really suck. So, hope, luckily, I didn't have to do that. Um, but yes, so, you know, I'm excited for the collab announcement tomorrow. I'm excited for the Steel Wool announcement. I'm excited for Five Laps. Hopefully, the Five Laps demo works. And as for t you know, maybe I'll give it some more chances. Um, maybe I'll just get the demo off the computer if it's not going to work. Um, um, and Into the Pit, instead of doing five hours, we'll do a three-hour video on that to kind of make it a little easier. Um, now, will this video get posted today? Depends. I do plan on filming like a small thing for the big film for the project, um, like shortly after this. So, uh, yeah, I might wait a little bit for that, but, you know. Hopefully we can get this posted today. I don't know. Um, as for the songs video, the earliest I can say that that's going to be recorded is the 9th, as every day from now on until the 8th is going to be preoccupied by, again, like an actual piece of the week. Because I still have some other 10th anniversary videos of my own, obviously. The Try to Last video, it's not going to happen. I'm not going to redo it, just because um, the song video, hopefully on the 9th. Um, after that, I will be doing some, I'll be doing a couple videos on the movie. I'll be doing one video of, like, listing off all the Easter eggs. Um, I have a whole list. It's, like, not quite a hundred Easter eggs, but close. Um, I'm also going to then do, like, a series video for the movie. And I'm probably going to do, like, a couple of tier list videos for, like, the game and such. Um, so yeah, that is the Scott interview. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and leave a like. And, um, yeah. So, I hope y'all enjoyed. If you did, be sure to leave a like for our good friend Scott Coffin, and our good friend Docco. Um, be sure to subscribe um, for more 10th anniversary content, more FNAF games, and more videos in general. Uh, I will be playing Help Wanted 2 in the near future. I have the Oculus right over here. <clears throat> so I'm very excited to play up in the near future. Um, of course, I'll do more FNAF games in general. Uh, yeah. But I will see you all tomorrow for the collab interview, which might be Fortnite. We'll see. Anyway, see y'all then. Goodbye.